Welcome to the Bernard Norman podcast. This is where I interview experts in the fields of Web3, AI and entrepreneurship. Today I have a special guest. He's here for the second time, so he must be special, right? And we will be talking about tokenization mainly. And um, I think this is really interesting because tokenization might be one of the clearest and best use cases for blockchain technology. And so talking to a true expert who not only is a ultimate blockchain OG developing the Ethereum blockchain back in the days, the fourth person working on Ethereum. Uh, so, so it really goes, it goes way back, has lots of experience. He's building a company that helps German companies tokenize their equity. This is a, a, a paradigm shift. This is, I mean, tokenizing the world. We've been hearing it for a long time. And I think it is going to happen. And what Christoph is building is one step towards that. It's really interesting. We have a really deep talk on, on blockchain and on tokenizing. Hope you enjoy it. Today we have Christoph Jensch here. Um, Christoph, welcome to the show. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, this is the, the second time uh, you, you were on the show nine months ago. I looked it up. It's episode 31. Uh, for everyone, check it out. It's, it's a very nice background story about crypto. Christoph is a, is a real OG uh, from the beginning um, with Ethereum. And so uh, episode 31, nine months, uh, a lot has happened in the crypto space. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's like it truly is uh, like a couple of years it does feel like that um but before we get to where we are right now or or what has happened um maybe you could introduce yourself a uh, real quick quick um and maybe walk us through your your journey as uh, yeah everyone is labeling you as the as one of the the OGs uh, what does that mean and and where have you come from in the crypto space um, so the crypto space, I started in 2013, Bitcoin. This was during my PhD time. Um, I was, it, the, the, the long story short, I was like looking for a lot of uh, GPUs and then stumbled across uh, Bitcoin miners. I had no idea what this was. So I got into this. This was like my starting point and just tried to like buy a little bit for Bitcoin. Back then, I think it was like 80 or 90 euros um, on Bitcoin.de. So this was how it, how it started. So then a little bit later, um, I basically as a PhD student, you have a bit time to read papers and research things. And so I did read everything I could about Bitcoin. At that time, it was possible to re almost read everything which existed at the time. It wasn't that much. And so I stumbled upon the Ethereum white paper. This was end of 2013, beginning 2014. And I was totally fascinated that this idea of decentralization like it has like bitcoin was a decentralized currency could now be adopted to everything else because ethereum had this model of the ethereum virtual machine where you could put code in which could re represent almost everything and the ethereum white paper I'd, i recommend people to read it because Vitalik prophesied if you want almost everything maybe except of nfts but if it ens tokens all of those things uh really fascinating so I got totally into this. And then in summer 2014, I decided to pause my PhD. Unfortunately, I never finished it. So I then fully go into Ethereum. I started working for the Ethereum Foundation. So I was one of the early um, team members building the tech. So I was working for Gavin Wood, C++ team, and did all the testing. So one and a half years, we launched Ethereum one, one year later in summer 2015. This was an amazing journey working at this early days in the Ethereum team in Berlin. Um, very closely with Gavin Wood, Vitalik Buterin, Jeffy Wilke, and others. So I enjoyed it very much. Um, but then I had this yeah, entrepreneurial spirit. I wanted to start something by myself. But then I thought Ethereum would not be the currency of the internet. This is maybe Bitcoin, but it could be the currency of machines like IoT devices. So that's why I like the phrase building the economy of things instead of the internet of things and using Ethereum for it. And so we started a company called Slocket where we connected smart devices such, such as smart door locks and others to the to the chain so we could pay to open it, to use it for things like uh, a decentralized version of Airbnb. So with this, we needed funding. I thought about a token and long story short, we created the DAO. So the DAO was the first de like large decentralized autonomous organization. Um, it it be really began as a, like we, need, we wanted to make a token sale for Slocket. 
the result, well, now let's like we make a token sale for the universal sharing network. So like for everything mm -hmm. in the space, and we create a, a network for this. And then we thought, well, not just Lock should receive funding. Everybody can put money in. Everybody can make a proposal to get money out, including Slocket. So that initially, no money would go to Slocket at all. And this was mm -hmm. then the DAO. The DAO got a lot of traction in the beginning. It was actually very scary when it raised the first five or 10 million. This was still people thought, thinking about, well, Slocket money, kind of. And then it, the narrative changed into this could be something like a venture fund for Ethereum funding all kinds of Ethereum projects. So the narrative changed during the fundraising. They had raised something like 150 million euros or dollars at the time, roughly. And then the Ether price increased. It was at some point, I think, 220 million in it. Very scary. Then there was a hack, like the smart contract had a bug in it, the so-called re-entrancy bug that's famous now, or infamous if you want. And um, it led to a hacker being able to steal about like one third of the, one third of the Ether in the DAO contract. And the DAO contract hold about 14% of all ETH in existence at the time. So it was actually very systemic risk, if you want, for Ethereum. Then came the DAO wars, um, a very intense time in the Ethereum history. And the end result was there was a hard fork so that now it's Ethereum Classic and Ethereum. Um, on Ethereum, all the people who put money into the DAO were able to get it back. And... Then the story was over. We as Locket did continue. We did got did raise some money from VCs in, in Silicon Valley. We built up the company. I sold the company in 2019 when we were about 50 people, or rough, almost 50, um, to a company called Blockchains Inc. Back then, LLC. I after I sold the company, uh, I stayed there for two years. Then I made a six months break to re navigate like what I really want to do. And mm -hmm. then I came to the conclusion to do a venture studio and focusing on one project myself, which is called Tokenize It. So, but we might get to this a bit later. Tokenize It about yeah. tokenization of GmbH shares. But yeah, so far my story. Yeah, I, I would like to to talk about Tokenize It, uh, tokenize it in a bit. Uh, your company, very interesting. But before that, uh, I would lay would like to 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 lay the environment. Like, where are we? today what's what's the crypto what's the blockchain environment what do you see we have nfts we have web3 we have all this stuff um what do you see today so i would say we have never been in a better state than yet than today meaning um is the, the price has been uninteresting in the last couple of months uh, nothing happens it's okay no nobody cares actually i feel right now which is good uh, so people would say we are in a bear market but it's Let's just forget about the market for one minute. Uh, if you look at the projects, um, many projects take years to develop and execute and then publish or like shipping products. Many have started during the last bull market, um, 2000, maybe, I don't know, in the 1920s, and people started doing projects and they continued. And we are seeing now products shipped, protocols maturing. We saw a proof of stake coming out one year ago. Even, even nobody talks about it, but the big news is it has worked without a major hiccup. Like it's just, we made the shift, boring change in the protocol. And after that, it worked as it's supposed to be. But there was a minor thing so at one point. There was a, one block was not um, confirmed fast enough, but really quick fix. So nothing which actually interrupted the uh, uh, app layer. So nobody feel, did feel any of it. So it works really nicely. This is a big news. Although it doesn't come as news because it's just almost a year since proof of stake. Then we have the like, stable coins coming out from um, PayPal. Uh, two or three years ago, this would be like the biggest thing ever. Today, it's just like one of many news. And so many other big financial institutions shipping their products, integrating blockchain or stable coins and others. Think, let me, let me yep. zoom in there, Christoph. How, how do you look at uh, PayPal issuing a stable coin? What, what did that do with your mind? What did you think of what, what came up? It's maybe not what you think of, like, let's say, a uh, crypto anarchic an anarchy, like we want to go full crypto. This, this doesn't help there. Um, but maybe they, to, to also zoom out a bit what has happened in the last years, we started with people doing it purely because of their ethos and fighting big tech, big government and things like this and being independent. And that need to be like pure doctrine, meaning Bitcoin or Ethereum, pure decentralized applications. I remember on Reddit in, I think, 2015 or so, there was this thing, this app is 
app coin free. Like people that actually make advertise for this app works without additional tokens or we don't have our own tokens because this looks like scam and people create their own tokens for their projects. People that are very strongly motivated by the pure doctrine of decentralization and freeing men. Good. So this is still very valid and still actually valid and there. This, this has not stopped. This, this community still exists, but it didn't grow exponentially. This, um, this, those thoughts, they are still there and it's important that the technology enables it. On top of this, we now see integrations of very traditional companies using it for their benefit. Or, and then the nice thing is, is it all works nicely together. So if they create a token, this token can still be used as all those nice self-custodial wallets and DeFi ecosystems or Uniswap and things like this. So that's a good thing about it. It's integrating in those um, cyberpunk products mm -hmm. on our some, some things, such, such a thing as a PayPal stablecoin and other stablecoins mm -hmm. and banks issuing stocks and also other stablecoins and all kinds of assets. And actually our vision that everything would be tokenized in some way. This is absolutely happening in, mm -hmm. in so many ways. And it just took time. It took time on the legal side. It took time on the regulatory side, if you like it or not. So I'm not a fan of big regulation, but it's just how the world we are living in right now. And But it's maturing. People get more... Uh, like security when it comes to what are, the, what are the rules, at least in Europe. I mean, we have those problems as you see in the US, but even there, I think they will get solved at some point. Maybe the court is deciding or other things are changing, but you will get clarity. And so we have maturing legal systems, maturing regulation. We have now banks which just need five or 10 years to do something, which start, started in 2017, 18, when every conference was just talking about blockchain, similar like AI a couple of months ago, at least, was blockchain. And so every company started their blockchain strategy. And sometimes it takes years for them to execute mm -hmm. on this. But you see now the fruits of it. And all those, all those startups, they have just continued to build. And they have such a mature ecosystem now of many applications nicely working together. We have, and I also think we have made a little shift from maybe some esoteric use cases. And DAOs are partially a bit like this, like dream of like total equality and a democratic world and which is good and i'm totally supporting this but we're still far from that to very down to earth use cases like payment payment is so boring but payment is so important and we see um, the stable coins and also no, i'm a big fan of gnosis pay uh, which have integrated like this monarium they have a euro e which is uh, the e-money license they have now a visa card that you can pay uh, using this from your wallet and we are tackling the original problem with Bitcoin tried to tackle. Bitcoin was supposed to be a payment system. It's far from that right now. And even Lightning mm. is a, a hope, but it's I don't think it will work for at scale. But we are seeing now with those stable coins and with Gnosis Pay and other systems a, again tackling those boring problems. And tokenization was everybody was talking about it during the ICO hype in 2016, 17, 18. Then the regulators came, then we had all those security tokens and they didn't work as much as we were thinking because they didn't change the way things work, just put a token on top. and uh, But still, this vision of tokenization takes longer, but it absolutely happens. It's like slowly and then all at once. That's what I feel right now. But all projects mm -hmm. are nicely evolving, and I'm that, therefore I'm so optimistic about the future. It's just no big news in terms of this one big thing is happening. The big thing is all the small things happening. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, I, I would like to um, quickly go back on what what you said with uh, also the the PayPal token, the PayPal coin, the interoperability. Yeah. How how do you think about this? Because this is fascinating, right? Like there was this company and they issued this this token now, yeah. and all of a sudden, even if they they want it or if they don't want it, you can integrate it into your app. You can uh, use it, so to say. And, and that's not the case in Web 2, right? Like if you build an, an app or something or a payment system, there's, there's no outside interaction going. How, how do you think about interoperability and how, how far are we? Is this, is this, yeah, is it possible? Is it still the idea of, of crypto and Web 3? Absolutely. So a couple of years ago, I often answered the question, uh, pe lots of people asked, what is the killer use case of blockchain. So that's what I often asked. And some people said, well, it's maybe payment or Bitcoin as a currency. 
my answer always was interoperability. If there is no single use case, that even back then when we built Slocket, this will not be their, their use case. It will be the interoperability of all those things, which which is the most important thing. Uh, this is what mm -hmm. makes it special. That what we built back then, like connecting IoT device to the chain, that someday they could pay, let's say, with a PayPal stablecoin to do something. And this is handled by a Gnosis safe. Um, and they are using just their ENS name to interact with them and looking up which address to transfer the money to. And the ENS system works nicely that they can change it to their current wallet. And this again works nicely with some other, let's say, Uniswap to automatically swap some tokens because the receiver would like to have this coin instead of this coin. And in the end, nobody sees any of this, but developers could all just integrate this permissionlessly. Permissionless interoperability. That's why I was so outspoken against private chains. Uh, at the time, because they actually destroyed all those uh, this interoperability. They just built their own ecosystem, like your intranet versus the internet. But I still want to, um, I'm still a bit cautious about this current state of interoperability. I think mm -hmm. Ethereum, public Ethereum was very interoperable, but the current development in layer twos um, make it actually more difficult. Because mm -hmm. now you have those different layer twos, Arbitrum, Optimism, ZK Sync, Starknet, even though they are, they are thinking about it and they are working on it, there are ideas how to do this. But still, it is 10 times easier to be to have an application living on the public Ethereum chain, interacting with like Uniswap or some multi-six, other things. And there you have really nice interoperability. But if they now live on one on ZK Sync, the other on Optis Optimism, the other on Arbitrum. Um, you cannot just call their contract there. All mm -hmm. systems work a bit different. Some have an EVM, some not, and different kinds of EVMs, and they may have some edge cases you have to think about if the contract still works there. So and then you have to think about Pritchess and then even things like Polygon and so on, which are only accessible through Pritchess right now. And Pritchess means lots of transactions which you should check. So you cannot just, let's say it's a, Think about that now, executing a smart contract, someone would make a proposal, they would vote mm -hmm. on it, and then it would be executed. You could not do something like this today with, let's say, Polycon or some ZK Sync and Optimus and Arbitrum systems, because someone had to check when this transaction through. Yes, it went through. Now we need to trigger something from there. There are systems like Chilato and others, which are trying to build automated uh, transactions in it, but it's not directly on chain. It's another service on yeah. top which is doing something. So interoperability is not in the same state as it was maybe one or two years ago, which is just, we are, it's because of scalability, we have to compromise a bit on interoperability. And this, yeah. I think, will be the next challenge once scalability is solved through layer twos, then the next challenge will be how can we again have interoperability through, mm -hmm. um, in those, uh, between those layer twos this is uh, to be like the next three or five years, I think this will be a major topic. Yeah, really interesting. So can you also say that that decentralization makes interoperability a little harder? I mean, it would make sense, right? But like if if you take uh, layer twos and, and CK sinks and stuff as more decentralization away from just Ethereum. It's maybe not... It, it, I, your thought is going in the right direction, but Ethereum was centralized in the view of one tech stack, mm -hmm. uh, but the tech stack itself was governed or uh, run by a, a decentralized community. So I would say it was completely decentralized, but uniform, let's call this uniform tech stack, not centralized. Like that, you know what the EVM, how it worked, the protocol was uniform. And with those other um, systems, you lose this uniformity because you get different kind of protocols being built which are not directly interoperable. Um, so, but again, there are people working on it, and I really, really hope to succeed. They can come to a table and make a make it work that those layer twos can easily speak to each other, that applications can be talking to each other, and permissionless building can happen again. Um, yeah. So I, I was talking to some friends uh, last week and um, they were very excited about Ethereum and what they're building. And in, in their vision of the future, 
the the sharding and everything that's that's planned for ethereum down the line so so making transactions really very uh, cheap and and very fast and they said okay mm -hmm. if that happens we don't need layer twos and and everything above it anymore and um yeah i was wondering how you think about that or have you have you given that thought the initial idea of sharding was that all those shards are technically the same except of one, uh, which has actually EVM in it. And what we see today, you, you could think of all those layer two are like different kinds of shards. And it's more like the, the marketplace, whoever builds the best thing compared to we are building this one system, this cathedral, how it should work. Mm -hmm. So it's going in a better direction in terms of experimentation. But again, uh, losing a bit into operability. But sharding, um, as, as I understand the plans right now, is more about very cheap trans, uh, as a data availability layer for those layer twos, which they still need to be run. Mm -hmm. So right now they have to commit on layer one on Ethereum. Um, some have the data, data somewhere else. Some have it on chain. It depends, like especially for the zero knowledge proofs. Um, that is, this was always for me the difference between Starknet and ZK Sync. That Starknet would have the data somewhere else with a, like. They try to have a multi sig or committees, um, always making sure the data is available for those proofs. Whereas ZK Sync would hold all the data necessary to prove on chain, which is nicer but more costly. So once sharding is there, they could use those shards to have very cheap data availability. So it's the sharding will still come, but maybe not as people think that they were like completely different systems. That's where mm -hmm. you will interact with those layer twos. What I Maybe foresee, let's see if it's, if it's true or not, that you have all those layer two systems now. And maybe, and that for some it sounds bad, I think actually good, if a winner takes it all system in terms of which protocol, which system is it. So meaning if, for example, Starknet or ZK Sync or some, something else wins this layer two battle, then you would have many layer, um, th some people would call it charts, I would call it like diff same layer two like systems. So many mm -hmm. set case things, so to say in parallel, but they can make it work to be interoperable. So if you mm -hmm. have everything coming from the same protocol, then interoperability is much easier and they all would use shards to put their data on. So it would again look like a more or less uniform tech stack, but only for some edge cases, you might use another kind of layer two, which is more, which is better for your case. A bit similar to what people did that it did back then with private chains to say, well, I have to have very specific chain parameters which fit my needs and I don't fit on layer one on Ethereum. So they could say, we are using, everybody's using the same kind of layer two, except of they, they have a bit of a different one. They're not as interoperable as the rest, but the rest uses, let's say, a set casing style layer two, and they have found a way to talk to each other. And with this, we have scalability and interoperability. But I could be totally wrong. It could be that we have, we still have four or five major set, uh, layer two systems, which then mm -hmm. gets replicated a lot. And we still have this fragmentation, which of course costs a lot of inter costs us a bit of interoperability. Mm. Interesting. Very, very deep talk. Uh, I could go on for hours, but um, yeah, let, let's come back um, to to the, the current state. What, what's your your view on on Web three? How does an OG crypto guy think of the 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 development what's what's going on in web3 and so, uh, so coming back to the initial thought <laughs> meaning it is is in a very good state and we get back to mm -hmm. actual use cases so less focus yeah. on price and market more focus on actual users and so that's why I said payment is one uh, of the main things mm -hmm. being focused on again right now also by coinbase with their layer two base, which is also a nice development, um, they are focusing on payments. So this is one thing. The other thing which was clear since the DAO and ICOs is tokenizations of company shares. It might be a boring use case, has been worked on now since many years, uh, but it's starting to evolve. And that's what we are building with tokenized. So we are going back to very hands-on down to earth use cases what people really need. So especially, especially in Germany, you know, GmbHs, you have to go to a notary, there's this public register called Handelsregister and all those things. And they make it very complicated, bureaucratic to change anything there. And the tokens, they again have liquidity, you have easy 
investments for business angels, family and friends, or for public fundraising. And we are making this accessible. Here's just one example. So our case is for doing this for the GBH. But you also see companies like Cashlink and others focusing on AGs and other kinds of um, uh, like bonds and other tokenizations of different kinds of assets. Um, we have seen banks working on it in the, in the US, in Europe. So this is moving nicely along. Infrastructure is getting created. I just looked at Swarm.com. you are creating nice infrastructure for trading of those um, assets. So all of those things, it, they've started being built in 2017 and 18, but it was too early. Too early in the mm -hmm. sense of regulation was not there. It's, people did not know what the wallet was. Like the adoption of crypto in general was so low that the, the, the market was so small. Today, maybe in NFTs, even though this is a completely different topic in the sea, like art, and it seems like it has nothing to do with it, but still got people introduced into crypto, having a wallet. So if you today talk to someone randomly on the street, the chance that they know what, their, what a crypto wallet is, they may even have one, is at least 10 times higher than in 2017 or 18. Mm. And all this helps to make uh, the timing now much better. So today building tokenization of GmbHs or HEs or other assets it's much better, a much better market. People understand what you're doing and you're actually solving a real world problem. So we are back mm -hmm. to, I mean, been, people asked you, what is this DAO thing for? Let's like, say my parents, it was hard to explain. Um, they could think about, well, there is things like um, co-ops or German Genossenschaften, which are maybe similar in spirit. Why do you need like this tech sec for this? Why make it so complicated? Is it just for terrorism because you don't have like any AML or QIC checks? Uh, so a, normal people, didn't see much value in it, maybe except of some cyberpunks who wanted to have full autonomy and self-sovereignty and so, and so on. For them, it was super important. And it still is, and I still believe it is very important to have this layer. Like in terms mm -hmm. of, if you have a corrupt state, and some are, then this is like a fallback. Before there was no fallback. Now you do have a fallback for financial assets, at least in middle styles, even for organizations where they could operate uh, without intervention of the state. In the especially for corrupt states. So for, for them, it's still important. And people saw a lot of future there and they saw like those doomsday that the world will end. And yes, we have built a layer zero for those doomsday scenarios for corrupt states. Important as it is, it is not mass market. So and mm -hmm. now the mass market, uh, maybe this NFT, those community got in, is again payment tokenization. We are focusing on such easy, as technically easy use cases. And mm -hmm. we are stopped a bit on like if you have to look to a blockchain conferences in 2016 to 19, yet this, everything has to be done on chain. Like just classic, mm -hmm. if you have a ham on your hand, everything looks like a <laughs> nail. And so you had the, I felt that. Yeah, yeah, you had the most esoteric use cases you could imagine. Like mm. Everything had to be done that way and your whole life. And uh, you saw things like, which I still think is very important, identity. How many years have you worked on decentralized identity to just say, well, just use the ENS name? even though this is technically not the best way. I'm a fan of DIDs, so decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials, nice systems. Unfortunately, they have not taken off. Um, this was more a dream of how it should work, just unfortunately not how the real world works as of today. And we have stopped a bit on focusing on this changing the world from the ground up totally, even though it's, it's a bit of pain in me because I loved it. I loved this. Um, we, have, we felt like we are building the world up from the crowd again. We're building a new financial system. We're building a new identity system. We're building a new system for how organizations operate. This is how it felt in 260, 70, 80. Super energizing, uh, enthusiastic, visionary, bu building the world from scratch. Partially, we have succeeded, and it's still there. But now it comes the what do people need today? Do we have a tech to build it better than what is there today? Yes, we do. Let's give them GMBH shares. So as boring mm -hmm. as it sounds, or let's build a cheaper payment system. And but this is our if if we get this right, the other things might come. Because if people once people have a wallet, this is the actually path to freedom. If everybody has a wallet, then they have their own keys. Then you can do everything. And then they can use all those steps. And then it then the step or towards this. It's a cyberpunk vision, if you want, or total self sovereignty becomes much easier to go than today. Mm. 
So uh, yeah, you, you touched on it already. I, I would love to dive deeper into tokenization now. Uh, before we do that, could you define it for us? And and maybe you know, like maybe a, a quick definition. How how you what's tokenization for you? And also, why is it so attractive? Why why does everyone like kind of tend towards this? What's sexy about tokenization? So I'm not diving into like how tokenized works or legal framework, just a token. What is so important about a token? I remember 2015, DEF CON 1 in London, there was a talk saying Simon, forgot his last name, was working for consensus, first name is Simon, had this nice slide, everyone gets a, to gets a token. This like uh, Ofa Winfrey picture where she like uh, distributing things. And he was told this was before the DAO, before ICOs, before the tokenization of everything. And he was his talk was totally on spot. And what he was predicting, um, and what I think is happening, we saw with Bitcoin this possibility that you have a digital asset which you control and can easily transfer and move globally and as a transfer ownership if you want, or technically it's just the right to transfer it. And so exchanges got built and so on. With Ethereum, you got again another coin, Ether. But you get the possibility of creating coins or tokens. Coins and tokens are technically the same. Um, mm -hmm. So on it. And they could represent every, anything. It could be something on-chain. For example, the DAO token had no external asset behind it. It was just on-chain, a token representing ownership of this DAO and the DAO having ownership over other tokens. In that case, Ether. So in this DAO token, you could control where the Ether would be going, like funding projects. So tokens can mean a lot of things, but the, the core elements are the owner has full control of it as they control their Bitcoin in terms of non-custodial wallets or having their own private keys. As they control Bitcoin, as they control the Ether, they control their tokens. So, and the tokens can stand for everything. And it makes sense to tokenize assets such as stocks, bonds, shares, and so on. And also, this is now fungible tokens, we call them ESC20 tokens, where one token is like the other, like by like money, like stocks, if you have, they, they are the same. Then those non-fungible tokens, or NFTs, where they're not like the other, and one can stand for a piece of art or a ticket or some, some other things. Um, but you can still easily change ownership on chain or prove ownership. And even proving ownership is something important. You can have token-gated access. Only if you have a certain tokens, you have access to certain features, products, documents, whatever. Um, all this can now be done easily. Also those tokens, now we get into a, not just like the, the pure technical thing is having ownership and being able to transfer it, but then based on this, a complete ecosystem got built, the so-called DeFi ecosystem or decentralized finance, where you could take those tokens and easily swap it to, for other tokens in a fully decentralized manner. Or you could use it as a collateral get yourself a loan. Um, all those nice features got built based on the token standard. So tokens are a very important financial instrument today, which you can directly own, which works globally. There's almost no other system which is as global and permissionless as the public, public Ethereum chain or other chains, where you have those assets, tokens, where you can simply create them without asking for permissions, simply transfer them without asking for permissions, or if you want to have permissions for it, you can build in permissions as you want. But this is this powerful system, and we think it is much better than the traditional financial system. And if you think about this, Germany, they actually got it right with their commercial register called Handelsregister. They very early on figured out that maybe it's not the best idea to let the companies have their own books about who has how many shares of their company. Um, mm -hmm. This could be corrupted, could be uh, like, there's lots of problems which could happen with it. They could lose their, those records. And so it's, this would make their shares of companies without such a commercial register less in value because it's insecure. People could lose their right to them because maybe the company books got lost. And so nobody knows that they own those shares. So they actually had, you could even think about it, the first analog kind of a blockchain system. I would not call it a blockchain, <laughs> but from what it attempted to be, it was a good idea to say, let's mm -hmm. have one register, which is um, kept correct by the state. And you know, it doesn't matter to which notary you're going, which lawyer you have, if you are in there, and if you if it says you own 10% of this GmbH, you own it. 
no mm -hmm. matter what the CEO is saying, no matter what the board is saying, no matter what the notary or lawyers, they can all change. And hundred years later, it's still your name in there. And if you die, they, they have those laws how to um, how your children or others are getting this. But this was a good system, or is still mm -hmm. a good system. And with blockchain, we have the first real good alternative of another register again, which is hold independent of any single entity or people. Like there's not Vitalik, there's not a foundation, there's no entity. You can do anything about this. And but this time it's not bound to na national borders, it's global. So you have a global system having one registry. This is such an extremely powerful idea. As you mm -hmm. know, we have now created the best registry in the world. And this can be used for money, the first use case. It can be used for names such as ENS. It can be used for digital art and forms of NFTs. And it can also be used for stocks, bonds, shares of company because the blockchain is the best public registry which ever existed. So you could say it's the commercial registry or 100 register 2.0. And as such, we want to use it um, because a lot of use cases can be built on top of it. And if you think about tokens, it's basically tokens is something which is using this super powerful public registry instead of traditional bookkeeping or commercial registries and so on. That's how I would define it. Yeah, I love it. Uh, this is a beautiful um, definition. So how far have we come? Um, how this this idea sounds amazing. And, and I think uh, you, you mentioned a couple of benefits because wh while you were talking, I thought, hey, okay, the, the, Handelsreg the registry, the, the Handelsregister is not that bad, but obviously there is some, some parts where it's, uh, it's expensive, it's, it's slow. Um, it, it has a lot of hurdles for many people. It's not international. But how far have we come to make this idea of tokenizing the world work in, in the actual world, you know, like but, legally and practically? So technically, it works nicely. So technically, mm -hmm. since the theory was launched, it was there. And as you say, public registry in Germany, well, we have even read access. It's not as easy. You have, mm -hmm. uh, take, but legal, you have it. Uh, writing access only to the notary and it costs money. So, mm -hmm. and you, you mentioned the other things. This is technically, we have solved all of this with, uh, with the Ethereum blockchain. Now, legally, a bit of a story, like the DAO was created kind of in, just just do it without asking any too many, or that, without asking too many questions. So, and the DAO tokens had this uh, thing there was no legal entity behind it. Mm -hmm. It was just a thing which created it. And people ask, what is the jurisdiction? Well, it's the internet, the blockchain, if you want. So you could not even say which jurisdiction it was in. Uh, and people in Germany, people would say it's like a GBR, just like just people coming together, doing things without registering somewhere. Uh, but it was globally, so it was extremely difficult to find a legal definition of it. Some people thought mm -hmm. of it as this GBR. Some say maybe it's a, a fine, so... And there were lots of definitions. So this is how it started. It is we had pure on-chain tokens, which has no outside meaning. And then ICOs did the same. This was now 2017 around. People said, make credit create a project. There is a legal entity behind it, but the token itself is representing nothing. So if you read the documentations of those ICOs, they are non-profit organizations somewhere in the world, mostly Switzerland, non-profit foundations saying, here's a token. This token means nothing, is nothing, doesn't give you any dividends, rewards, no voting rights, it is nothing. But we say it somehow is linked to the success of our project, so please buy. So, and but remember, you're just donating money to a foundation, and some, some even even get a tax exempt for it because they're donating money to a nonprofit, and it was <laughs> crazy. So, if you think about it, because they said the token itself is nothing, but the reason we had a nonprofit foundation, it did make sense, was to not create a second cap table. So otherwise, you would have a for-profit entity with a cap table and the token cap table, what, where, where's the value? So a non-profit cap table is meaningless, and so all the value would be in the token. So then came the security token. What they did is, that because of regulators, let's use the traditional system. In terms of GmbH, it's the Hans Register. In terms of HEs, yes, they can keep their own books about it, or like Delaware Inc. and others. Let's, stay, let's say everything stays as is, And now we just create a new token and give this token some kind of rights. Um, but to transfer them, it's similar contracts, similar legal work. So it actually did make things wor worth. Because now you had the old things, signing this contract, and you still need to have a wallet and transfer the tokens. Mm -hmm. So, But only with a token, 
some work, I don't, I won't, don't want to say they're all the same, but a lot of security tokens had this problem that it's not enough to transfer a token, there's also an investment contract with it, implicitly or explicitly, which is a problem. Um, I don't know how deep you want to go in this, but the problem is you have this chain of contracts and it technically, if you are the receiver of the security tokens and you're also the receiver of an investment contract, you would have to check the whole chain of investment contracts that all each of them is valid. And if one of them is not valid, your token is worth nothing. So mm -hmm. this is a problem we, we solve with something called Auslobung or public reward. Um, you find more on the tokenized um, contracts if you want to go into this. So, but the question is, where do we stand? Mm -hmm. So we see those legal problems, they um, spurred more questions to the regulators. They have to solve those now, like what, what to do. In the US, there are still these problems about what is the security. They are still figuring this out. In Germany, we have the Mika regulation. Um, and in Europe, at least, it, Mika is giving more clarity, like what kind of tokens falls under what regulation. We have the EWPG in Germany, Electronisches Wertpapiergesetz, which makes it actually possible and for tokenizing bonds in a very clear legal framework. Mm -hmm. um, and it soon will also be possible to tokenize it as stocks from an AG. And this is very, very powerful. So Germany is actually moving into the direction to giving permission under clear legal uh, regulatory frameworks where you can tokenize real shares. So mm -hmm. company shares, not GmbH, just, just AGs. So meaning from a regulatory point of view, at least in Germany and Europe, they have made big, big steps. Um, I don't 100% agree with all ways they have regulated those things, but that's another point, but at least we have clarity. So mm -hmm. the US doesn't have it yet, but the Coinbase SEC battle will have one outcome or another. And even if it's if it's full Coinbase and if not, not everything is security, big win. If it's not, I still think in Germany you have to say things don't get eaten as much as, as, as hot as they are cooked. So mm -hmm. really, even if they say this might be a security, there might be another court case, in the end, there might be some middle ground and some mm. some regulations and laws will define those things. So there will be clarity there after. These just take a bit longer to follow another path of getting clarity. So, But at the end, you, you will get clarity. And the more clarity we have, the more big financial institutions step in. So like mm -hmm. banks and others. We have heard forecasts in 2017-18 that there's a trillion, $10 trillion, $30 trillion market for tokenizing those securities because they all th see how this is so much better than the old system. And they mm -hmm. all see they have built those electronic systems in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And they work and never change the running systems. So nobody dared to touch them or you know, this old COBOL code and so on. So, you know, they have this anarchic, like really old system, which works. And that one day will be an upgrade and ep almost everybody agrees this will be tokenized securities. This is the upgrade to the system. But they mm -hmm. are waiting until there's full clarity. They know what permissions and licenses they're needing. Like I recently spoke to a very large bank in Germany and they're currently, currently applying for being a crypto custodian. They're talking with us about tokenizing GBH. So they're full into the game. It's just, mm -hmm. you don't see this until like, they're ready. I just really want to say slowly then all at once. They, all those big banks are getting ready to holding tokenized securities or even issuing tokenized securities. They're providing their lawyers for it, their legal frameworks, they're getting the permissions for it. But you don't see any products out because this, it takes years for them to do this. And once they are there, then you will see them like coming out almost all at once. Then you see all new issuances, 50% being tokenized. Then maybe in five years, it's 90% tokenized, uh, tokenized securities being issued when, at, at first emissions mm. and then it takes another five years for like almost all the stock market running on chain in some way or another it just takes time but you see we are so clearly headed into this direction yeah very cool so if you could summarize what what are the benefits of a stock being uh yeah tokenized on a blockchain it is first of all liquid and you own it directly so you don't mm -hmm. have this that's to, to, today, yes, you would say liquidity is provided by a bank. But look at how it works today. You have the actually stock, in for, often actually in form of paper, sitting at some kind of custodian. And it mm -hmm. doesn't really get moved there. It just has a safe full of paper and charging lots of money for it. Which is, think about it, how ridiculous is this? Like, yeah. you pay this guy, just have a safe full of paper, which is the actual stock. So then he keeps track, track of which bank owns how much of it. 
And mm -hmm. you, of course, is using some kind of digital system for this, a hopefully good, secure database. So they, those banks track of my ownership there, how much is owned by my customers. So and then they have progress. And then you sell something, it goes to several layers of in bank database to interbank systems, progress systems, and you have all those systems somehow connected in this custodian. It just needs to make sure everything is right. So it's a chaotic system if you want, but it works. Um, it's okay. But if you have this on chain, it's so much clearer who has access mm. to one rest this key. Yeah. You can have it yourself. Yes, I anticipate still there will be custodians. It, the user interface will most likely look exactly like the same as our progress today. You have different progress, different, very similar user interfaces, but technically you can log in with your wallet, you can own them directly, or you can ask the custodian to own them. But it's such a more transparent, clear system and robust system yeah. that we have today. And just this very important part, I'm able to own it myself. Mm -hmm. And I'm such a big fan of owning things directly, like unconstrained ownership without any middleman. It's such a powerful thing. And that's yeah. possible through it. Yeah, for sure. Like there's just so much less points of failure. And and as you said, like I, I, I also like to own things myself. I don't think that's necessarily the future or anything. But as you, as you already said, custodial um, options uh, will be there. Very cool. So also cost. It's uh, it's single point of failure and cost yeah, factor. Cost for sure. Every Absolutely. intermediary in the, is charging. So mm. those middlemen are just making money easily often and you're cutting costs. That's why you see there was a nice summary of Syngnosis uh, posted something like this, how those neo banks and others they were cutting costs often to compared to traditional banks. But if you now mm -hmm. compare DeFi, you can swap like dollars to euros in forms of stable coins, and now as a um, with less costs than at a big bank today. So we are actually really saving costs because our systems yeah. are so direct. That's good. That's good. Uh, saving costs is uh, uh, is something you can sell very well. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. you've given us so much value. Let's get into tokenize it. You you founded a company a couple of years ago and you set out to tokenize things. What what are you tokenizing with tokenize it? And yeah, what's what's going on there? What what are the news? So currently we only tokenize German GBHs or it, it also U cheese, which is like a, a very similar legal structure. Um, this is what we are currently doing. But I mean, let's start with a long term vision, then go to short term. So we mm -hmm. want to become Something like the Web3 based AngelList of Europe. AngelList is a US company for business angel investments or other things. I like what they are doing. Um, and in the US, everybody's using Delaware Inc., everybody's using a safe or white company is safe for financing. And it's so standardized and it's not blockchain based, but it's still, it works nicely. In Europe, mm -hmm. you have different jurisdictions, everybody having different legal entity, that's be the GBH, the SAL, the LSC, UU, and uh, many others. So different countries with different laws and they're using different um, contracts for raising money at different stages. So nothing standardized is actually horror. So as a business angel investor in Europe, it's a nightmare. You would technically mm -hmm. have to uh, have a lawyer for each contract and pay thousands of euros just to make a small investment. And if the US investors are investing in Europe companies, they often, often even demand, please create a data ink and then have mm -hmm. your German company as a 100% daughter uh, just because we don't want to get into the, this mess. We don't know how this works. We only know how Data Ink works. This is our legal framework, so we don't get into something else. Mm -hmm. So that's the state of the art. And I want to get to the point where we have a legal framework for every European country, uh, country for all, all those legal entities where they can issue tokens, which are at least economically speaking, the same as the actual shares. Um, mm -hmm. And so the same legal framework just with adoptions depending on the jurisdictions and that foreign investors like US investors or Asian investors they trust the standard to know okay this token gives me those economic rights of a shareholder I know it's running on chain I understand wallets I understand tokens now and why they are good and I'm now completely fine with investing there uh, in any European company and also of course inside Europe it makes things so much easier it's, it gets liquid we have a standardized system and you can send out a link to your family, um, business agents, friends, and they can invest in seconds, uh, all with a standardized framework. That's my vision where I want to get at. 
So mm-hmm. how to get there step by step and focus. You had a nice video about focus recently. So don't do <laughs> things all at once. Do one thing. And so we focused on the German GmbH and get this 100% right. We have worked mm-hmm. now over a year with legal partners from CMS uh, to get this right. And I 10 minutes ago, I explained to this problem of uh, security tokens with this investment contracts that each, each time you buy a security mm-hmm. token, explicitly or implicitly, you are having an investment contract. We are still having this with our con- uh, tokens, but the risk is that this chain of contracts might have a weak link. If you have this, then the rights of the tokens go apart and a huge problem. So what we have done as a second as a safety net, if you want, which I think is even more important than investment contract, that the company is doing something which in Germany is called Auslobo. The best English translation would be public reward, which is that you publicly announce that you are rewarding a certain action. So mm-hmm. for example, if somebody finds my, don't know, phone, I can say you get 200 euros if you find my phone. I, can, I could make this legally binding as a public announcement. I could even go to the lottery if I want. So some things, same things happening for like uh, scientific problems. If you find the next prime number or something else, you're rewarded with, let's say, 1 million euros. And there are some institutions which are giving this out as public announcement, and this mm-hmm. is legally binding. So we're mm-hmm. using this uh, because this is like a one-sided contract. Only one side needs to sign. The other side has the rights without doing anything. The right to, if I do this action, I get rewarded. So mm-hmm. and we're using this that the companies um, creating a token publicly announce we are rewarding the action of holding the token and signing a certain transaction with dividends, liquidation proceeds, um, exit participation. So all the financial benefits a shareholder has, the thing. Mm-hmm. And also the option we, um, to have a pathway towards converting the token to actual shares. We call it the put option, the put option to give your tokens back and receive either um, cash shares or HC shares. Uh, mm-hmm. So shares, shares at GBH or if they convert to an HC there. So it's all in the contracts, but you can also become an actual shareholder. So with this, it's made sure that the token always has the value of one GBH share. Plus, mm-hmm. But you don't need to convert. You can just hold it because you have the same financial benefits. But you, what you don't have is voting rights. For getting voting rights, you have to convert. So mm-hmm. this is in short what a token is. But the, the rights are giving you based on this public announcement of the company because of an action you can only do because you have the token. So this means mm-hmm. no matter how you got the token, no matter, no matter what crazy DeFi protocol you use for 10 times swapping something, getting some yields, or then having it as a collateral, then somehow getting those tokens in your wallet, it doesn't matter if you don't even know where you got it from because you don't know this investment contracts. So if you mm-hmm. have the token, you can do those actions which give you those benefits or those rights. And this is the important part. So our link from those participation rights and the tokens are ext- extremely strong through this mm-hmm. public reward or our global. So this is how we solve this problem. Other than this, I just explained to you what rights the tokens is giving you. So I said, economically speaking, you have the same rights as a shareholder. You can convert to actual shares and get also the voting rights if you want. With this, we have now a technical token which can be used for fundraising, private offers, employee participation, public fundraising. And now we have this other side of the problem, which is, which is like um, in German Aufsichtsrecht. So in US, you would say like the SEC, that how security tokens can be sold to the public or to individuals. And here, Germany is actually not that bad. People often think, oh, you cannot do anything with this. You have to do a utility token. Because if you don't do a utility token, uh, you're like, everything is illegal. That's mm-hmm. not the case. So. Technically, yes. If you sell those security tokens, you have the uh, duty to have a prospect, which is expensive. But there are lots of exceptions or exemptions to this rule. One is if you sell it to a group smaller than 150. So this means business angels, family and friends round easy. Mm -hmm. So on our platform, if you sign up, you can create a link, send it to your family and friends or business angel you have made a deal with. There's a private offer with the terms. They accept, transfer the money, get the token without any prospect or anything else. If you want to make it bigger, like make, do a public fundraising, um, up to 8 million euro, you have to use something which is called Wertpapierinformationsblatt, WIB in Germany. Uh, this is easy to get, two or three weeks, a couple of thousand euros, not too much. And then you get this, and with this on our platform, because we have a program license through a liability umbrella, you can fundraise um, mm-hmm. to everyone. So we have this ICO feeding coming back, 
just in a compliant way. Because ICOs had really bad projects, but the fundraising pro process was really good. So we want to have the same fundraising process, just good projects with really companies oh, doing yeah. real things. That's in short yeah. what we do. Yeah, I love it. So so, so could you um, maybe zoom in on what does it unlock? Where's, where's the tremendous benefits now for maybe the company itself and, and also the, the people wanting to invest in the company. Yeah, so one is the obvious thing. It gives you a very fast digital process. So a digital cap table where you can digitally have a easy fundraise. That's obvious. That's already very valuable. Then the maybe not so obvious thing. Number one is you have one asset for all stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Today, in like GmbH, you have your investor having a convertible note. You have the actual founders having shares in the company. You have the employees having a VSOP or something like that. All Which our stakeholders share. in the companies, but they have a different asset. So they cannot trade or exchange anything. So mm -hmm. here you have a token, which is liquid and it's, it's transferable, which is, gives you a stake in the company across all stakeholders. So this unification alone is very, very important. You have the same for an AG. That's why stocks from an AG are also nice because... Everybody can have to say, employees, founders, mm -hmm. and investors, and you can easily trade them. So we get this benefit now into the private companies in the GmbH. It's actually a huge, huge, huge benefit. So yeah, it's, it, if I may, like, add, like, I, I listened to, to a podcast and they, they talked about venture capitalists all the time. And it's actually one of the leading reasons why companies go public in the US is to to get the stocks to clear their cap table to make it less complicated like it's yep. it's it's really a, a big issue for for many companies so you get this benefit the second mm -hmm. is what i like to call continuous fundraising people often think in pre seed c series a b c d uh, why because we have to get all investors across the board aligned you have to negotiate all the contracts with them until all are fine with it and then after like 3 months sometimes even 6 six months You're, you're done and you're signing and there's this big event and then you get the money all at once and you're happy now. And, and during those six months, you cannot do anything in your company like in mm. terms of pivot or changing direction. You have told the story, you need to keep the story, the narrative needs to be the same. Uh, you're like, really hope they will close. They have to wait until everybody else is closing. So you're done. He's not done yet. You have to like cat do this cat herding of investors. And this is so nerve wracking that you want, don't want to do this all the time, so you do it in rounds. Mm. So And uh, then you have lots of money all at once, and then people sometimes, new, especially first-time founders, do this mistake that they think they're rich now, and they can now hire 10 people all at once and buy fancy new stuff. And then after one year, they see, well, where's the money gone? And we have a big problem. We don't have product market fit yet, no revenue yet. So we really mm. need to have another round. And this is just really bad. So mm -hmm. but instead to say, I have this token now. I can just say, I meet this investor at a conference. He wants to invest 100K. He's a business angel. Um, we say, well, let's say the company is worth 10 million. I send you a, a, sync, a link out, see your terms, accept, pay, done. And so since February, I'm raising money for Tokenize It. I have now come to with now at almost 1 million. It's super relaxing. I meet someone, send out a link, they transfer the money, I'm done. So it's now, even though we will make a press release about a round, but in that case, the round is just at the same valuation. So um, as soon I will increase the valuation and then, but continue the same thing. If I meet someone who wants to invest, invest, I send them the link and if they want to, they can. But it's a continuous process. I'm not hiring 10 people now. I basically, mm -hmm. it's like always selling. You're selling your product, you're selling your company. I'm only raising as much as I need to. It's a continuous inflow of money as needed. Um, I can, if I need more, I would push a bit more and try to find investors. I think I need less, I push less. Um, it's such a better, the process is so much easier and better. Um, one other founder I'd recently talked to, um, he compared this to, in the HC, there's something called genehmigtes Kapital. So meaning your shareholders give you the right to issue a certain amount of stocks. And you're, mm. as, a, as a CEO, you're free to do this for employees or for other things or invest, get investments and whatever. This, the same hasn't really existed for GmbH. There are every fundraising round need to be agreed by all the shareholders to get everyone together and have a, a like, resolution which they sign. Here, we're using the same mechanisms that the shareholders give the CEO a certain allowance to create tokens uh, up to a certain amount. And then he's free 
to issue them for investments to employees to whatever he wants to. So it becomes again extremely unbureaucratic and easy. So that's how how I experienced the product so far. So those are the three main points. So a digital process, which is easy and fast, um, mm -hmm. not comparable to notaries, the standardized contract. Um, second is a unified assets across all mm -hmm. stakeholders. And the third is doing continuous fundraising, even up to yeah. public offers. You can have this invest now button on your website, allow the public to invest once you're ready, not just business angels, continuously according to your terms. Yeah. I, I get, I totally get how it changes, but I'm, I'm still like trying to put it together in my head with the, the rounds, you know, like why is it so much more continuous? Because you still have to do the advertising, tell your story, right? Like you still need to convince the people and, and that's what well, you do in, in this funding round. You, as you said, you tell maybe the same story a, a lot of times. Uh, it can't really evolve that much. <laughs> But but how how is it more continuous just because okay. the te the tech is different in in the background? Okay, so don't know if we have have raised around yet, but I've done. And so let's take one practical example of Slocket. So we had a handshake deal. I think it was beginning of November with an investor. First thing he told us: don't get any other investor, and in. I'm, I'm your only one. He did invest two million dollars, and so then we started the negotiation the contracts. During the mm -hmm. time, I was like, should I hire this? guy now should i get this office now um, is, is the money really coming i don't know and uh, so it was uh, lots of uncertainty where i was mm -hmm. this like, big chunk so then we found, found out maybe the story about universal share networks not the best that maybe focus on the store lock example but it's different from the pitch so should we tell him but he did, did, did convince he was convinced of our pitch and wants to invest based on this we now tell mm -hmm. a different story so maybe let's wait for the with this maybe for in, in three or four months so it, this was the situation. Now compare this to tokenize it. I got the first investor. I sent him the link. A couple of weeks later, I got the money in. So this is done. So if I tell him three months later, we have learned now, this was not a good idea. We are pivoting. It's not a problem. So I'm continuously receiving it. If one of those mm -hmm. investors would say, no, it's okay. It's just like 100K or 1 million. It's a, mm -hmm. it's, it's a continuous process, not just for those business agents. Now think about public fundraising. If I have an invest now button on my website, I'm advertising to the community or my users. And I'm saying, that's my current valuation. I'm raising up to 1 million and everybody can come in now. This can come in continuously. I just need to, of course, be transparent with what I'm doing. So there are parts which do not change. But with the things which do change is you get immediately the money, not just mm -hmm. after everything is done. The negotiation, yes, I cannot say there's zero negotiations, but we have templates and contracts which should be used as is or can be used as is of course, mm -hmm. we are not doing legal advice. We are not a legal advisor, so you should have your lawyer look at it. Um, but technically, they are good. They are proven. And you can just use them. And we are often saying to those people, yes, of course, you can change small things. You should have a law legal uh, counsel look at it. But don't make major negotiations and change everything about this. Just make it so complicated. Just use it as is. Um, mm -hmm. So it's the same for all of them. So even True. this, uh, because we want to have this unified asset, same with stocks. The investor does not argue about the rules of the stock market and the stocks and that his stocks should be different than other stocks because if they would, they cannot trade mm -hmm. because then they become NFTs. Then they become non-fungible. And then you cannot, uh, they say each investor is a different NFT if you want. Yeah. Uh, this, they cannot just easily trade, uh, it's especially not like different numbers and so on. So that's why mm -hmm. it's important to have these unified assets and with, with this comes unified contracts and you should just use them as, as they are. So, Yes, it does, sim it does really simplify things and yep. makes things quicker. And you can, as I said, continuously change the terms for your public fundraising. Say your company is going very well, just change the valuation and increase it by 10 or 20%. So if you do, if you do any change, there's a one-day break uh, because you mm -hmm. don't want to get um, surprised. So there's a stop of issuance. After this day, you can continue to the new terms. And that's something which is not like normally used in, in other companies. They say, well, next week I have a different valuation. Next week I have a different yeah, valuation. Yeah, totally. but, but here you can technically do this. And they can always yeah. see those are the current terms. They can accept them now or not. Yeah, very interesting. No, it, it will it will unlock a whole different way of thinking about fundraising probably also. And I, I can, I mean, I, I've um, yeah uh, gone, gone through many uh, fundraising processes on actually both sides and 
uh, I, I can 100% see that this makes it easier. So how how is it received? You've I, I think the, the product launched two three months ago or something. Like uh, what's what's the current state? What uh, do you see? I think or we launched it now. It's almost, I think we launched in end of June as a beta. So we have not okay. launched a product yet in terms of production, mm -hmm. but you can use it as a beta. And mm -hmm. we have we have, we have used it for ourselves. There's another external customer who has used it for his fundraising. We have, I think, five people right now in the onboarding process. So what we do experience is um, it takes a bit of time because let's say um, I convince you now to do this. And we have convinced mm -hmm. many now. We have I think, lot, lots of leads and, as I said, companies are doing onboarding. They now need to wait for the next fundraising round. Then they need to convince their investors. So it's not like other products which you just advertise and use today and you close. It's yeah. more like if I convince you today, let's say you raise within the next six months, then you let's say in six months say now I'm raising one million, then you are going to investors, explain them this GmbH token, and then maybe you are closing in eight months. So mm -hmm. the sales cycle, if you want, is pretty long. Um, yeah. But so far, the feedback we have gotten from founders is really, really good. They see it how it's so easy to set up. You don't have, you technically, although we advise to have a lawyer, you would not need one if you trust our contracts as they are. Um, mm -hmm. So you're saving yourself a lot of costs and time. And then just sending out this link and they are going through like this process of investing is so much easier. So yeah, yeah. this is what you get as, as feedback and they're looking forward to use it. It's just we are we are launching also employee participation by beginning of next month, so we are in the process of launching mm -hmm. those products and getting out of beta and talking to lots of people and get incorporating their feedback. And so I think if we speak in nine months again, then I hope that we can speak about all the successful cases which have used it. Yeah, and to, to be honest, I mean the more you say it, this is how it should be. Like, why would it not be in a in two thousand twenty three in a digital age? Why would it not be Hey, I sent you a link. If you if you convinced, uh, click on it and let's invest. Like, why should it? It, it that should be the case, right? Like that. Uh, I really like that vision, and uh, you make it reality. That's that's really cool, and I think that's how it makes sense. Investing as it's supposed to be, or fundraising as it's supposed to be. That's, there you as, go. As a founder, that's how, how I always wanted it. It's also how yeah. I wanted to um, give my employees um, participation rights. That's how it should be. And I build exactly how I, as a founder, would like to see my cap table and issue, um, that, that case, participation rights for all kinds of people and incentivize them. Maybe the last thing, you know, time is, we need to close soon, but... Another thing which has not been used by many GmbH is incentivizing your community to do certain things. That's something which comes from the crypto world, kind of. It is saying, mm -hmm. if you use my product or buying it, you actually get some tokens for it, a fraction of a token. Or if a certain partner comes in, you can incentivize people even automatically to do certain things. If this, then that. That's what we spoke about in the beginning with the DAO. So you can say, if this, log in, use product or recommend it to your friend, it's just typical referral programs or whatever, then you receive X amount of tokens. And you can automate automate this. Try this with mm -hmm. your traditional GmbH shares. So <laughs> this is something you can really only do when you have a digital token and to con uh, distributing them that way. Yeah, very cool. Last quick question. Uh, uh, yeah, to be aware of your time, we're, we're way over the time uh, by now. Too interesting. Um, so, so on the on the on the side of the investor, like I I buy this token, I I click on this link, I buy it. Can I resell it? Is it a liquid token? Is there any legal problems? Know your customer KYC kind of stuff, or what's what's going on here? How's so that practically? Technically, yes, you can do whatever you mm -hmm. want with it. You have the right to transfer it. Legally, it's a security token, so it should act as such. Meaning, yes, if you have a friend who wants to buy it like under this um, 150 investor rule, you can always just trans make a deal with everyone you want. So mm -hmm. if you publicly sell it, then you fall under those security laws, which is not impossible, but a bit harder for a single investor. Uh, I think he doesn't want to do this. So he would then go to a security token exchange. So mm -hmm. those tokens can be listed by any security token exchange. And actually, we want to build one in the near future, not not the general security token exchange, but one for our GmbH tokens. So this will mm -hmm. like building a secondary market. But 
as of today, yes, you can sell it to a friend, you can sell it to individuals, um, no problem, not publicly, but if you go on a security token exchange or this near future, our security market, a secondary market, then you can sell it there. Love it. Okay, very cool. Uh, Christoph, thank you so much for your time. Uh, let's uh, let's round it up. Where where can people find you? Where can people tokenize uh, find tokenize it? And what would be your your recommendation for them? You know, like uh, check it out. What should they do with it? Yeah, as the name says, tokenize it. So tokenize.it is our website. Just you can go there, read all the stuff on the website, and sign up as a founder if you want, um, and get your company ready for it. That's what I would recommend. You can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and all the other social media channels. I'm personally most active on Twitter. So C-H-R Jensch. So I know it's a lot of letters. G-E-N-T-Z-S-C-H. Uh, so, but maybe you have it somewhere in the description. So you can find yes. my Twitter link. And uh, other, other than this, just Google tokenize.it. You can find all the information. Very cool. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming on on the show. Welcome. It was a great time. All right.